Welcome back. I hope you all have had a nice time for lunch and also I hope some have joined the lunch discussion via Zoom. Uh, now we are gonna finish the day with the last presentation. Uh, as I said earlier today, here it is uh, early afternoon and in Pennsylvania where we have Lindsay Cook uh, there it, it's early, early morning. Warmly welcome, Lindsay. You are going to talk about 3D documentation and the restoration of Notre Dame in Paris. And as I told you earlier on, this has been, Notre Dame has been mentioned during the day. So we are so looking forward to hear your presentation. Uh, uh, kindly ask questions in the chat. We will have a few minutes after your presentations to take questions, but I know you have an early meeting also today. So we're going to finish at uh, 1.15 today, so you can manage to get to your, uh, to your other meeting. Uh, but welcome, Lindsay. The screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Nina. Can you see my presentation now? Can you just confirm? Yes, that you can and I also hear you. So Excellent. everything's working. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'm so glad to be with you all today and I wish that um, I were able to attend more of the presentations. But as you heard, um, it's very, we're sort of not yet, have not yet reached daylight um, here in Pennsylvania. So I'm so glad to be here um, and to contribute a little bit about um, my understanding of the 3D documentation that exists of Notre Dame of Paris um, and the ways in which it has, both has and has not been used uh, so far in the restoration campaign. You're seeing here um, in my first image a couple of renderings from um, the, on the one hand, Andrew Tallon's 2010 laser survey of the cathedral. And you're seeing on the right, um, on the other hand, a composite, uh, part of a composite model that has since been compiled um, by the CNRS in Paris. Um, and I'll be explaining a little bit about how both of these came to be and also the ways that they're being used in the restoration. You're seeing here an image, um, not only an image before taken before the Notre Dame of Paris fire, where we have a sense for the silhouette of the building, um, which is, I think, only recently and since the fire comes so much into focus, where we understand, for example, how important the roof line is in understanding the image of Notre Dame and even experiencing the cathedral throughout the city of Paris. Um, in my most recent trip to Paris, I was thinking about this. I was there for the, pretty much the whole summer and was considering all of the places from which you used to be able to see, um, you know, sort of get a glimpse of the roof. Um, and now maybe you're able to see um, the Pantheon or another monument actually, um, because the roof has opened up a vista that was no longer, that was not previously there. Um, but I'm also showing you this image because it comes from a very important time in the history of 3D documentation of Notre Dame of Paris. Um, 2011 was a kind of hinge when um, the 2010 laser survey undertaken by the Vassar architectural history professor Andrew Tallon um, was begun. And he then went back in 2012 to um, take additional um, details, especially to consider textures of the building. Um, and I'll talk about why it was he was going there to do that. Um, but this is a kind of key moment, and I want to highlight this, which is to say, you would probably have thought that by this year, there would have been a lot of documentation of Notre Dame of Paris. And in fact, if the fire of Notre Dame that took place in 2019 had taken place instead 10 years before in 2009, virtually none of the 3D documentation, both digital and hand-drawn um, that we have of the cathedral, virtually none of that um, existed uh, before around the year that you're seeing illustrated here. I'm assuming, especially if Notre Dame has been evoked earlier in the day, um, that you're all aware of what happened on April 15th, 2019. Um, and I'm using these particular images, especially the aerial view down below, and a close up of some of the roof trusses of the nave as they're collapsing uh, during the fire, just to highlight the fact that while the fire was largely 
you know, destructive in many ways and um, also challenged the structure and there was concern, uh, particularly about collapse, um, not only in the days and weeks after the fire, but really for a couple of years, there was sort of a lingering concern on the site uh, that there could still be some kind of collapse. But most of the stonework, most of the vaults um, remained intact and have proven to be structurally sound for the most part, um, with some minor exceptions, you know, holes um, in one of the nave vaults, for example, and of course, famously, um, the crossing vaults of the, um, of the nave and choir, where, uh, or nave and transept, rather, where the spire fell through and crashed through that stone vault. But above all, the thing that was destroyed and, and needs then to be repaired in one way or another is the timber roof, which dated to the 13th century for the most part, um, as well as the 19th century spire that had been added uh, by Ville le Duc. In the immediate aftermath of the fire, um, this was the state of the building, and this is also when questions began to emerge about what kind of documentation existed of the Cathedral of Paris. At this point um, in time, I was a visiting professor um, at Vassar College, where I had previously been an undergraduate student um, studying under the direction of the man you see here, Andrew Tallon. And um, we had worked together on various projects, but of course, I as an undergraduate at the time and, and someone starting my graduate education, and he um, really as an early career researcher, I want to highlight that, that this was one of the, one of the first things he did um, in his career, really, as an architectural historian specifically, was to think about um, laser scanning and 3D documentation. It was at the forefront um, of his mind. You're seeing him here. Um, uh, along, you can you probably recognize where he is, but underneath the, um, along the parapet around the choir of Notre Dame, so where he's underneath the, the flying buttresses. And this is a notable uh, place for him to be standing, his favorite part of the building, and also the reason, frankly, that led him to um, want to create a laser survey of Notre Dame of Paris. It had to do entirely with studying the structure of Notre Dame, and especially its flying buttresses. But the survey was not limited. That was begun in 2010, as I said, and completed in 2012. It did not, it was not just limited to the masonry structure, as you can see um, from the like a scanner that you see in the in the left foreground, um, there was attention paid really to the most of the building. The idea was to create a, a comprehensive scan of Notre Dame of Paris. Oops. Going to try to show you just a little bit of video. I know it won't work so well. Might be a delay. Just to bring you there um, to the year 2012 when the sort of finishing touches were, were uh, put onto the scan. And what resulted, of course, is a point cloud, and you're seeing a rendering from that um, from that point cloud now. Um, and and this I think relates also to the reason, the sort of the, the background and the and the reason that it was produced in the first place, is that um, the goal here was a couple of things. One was to study the structure of Notre Dame. I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, and the other thing was to produce um, basically illustrations for a book that Andrew was writing with Danny Sondron, the Sorbonne uh, University professor. And so the two of them wanted to create a series of hypothetical models and thought that it would be um, useful to have as the basis for all of those hypothetical renderings um, an accurate representation of the cathedral in its current present day state. So that was another of the, uh, another impetus for creating the laser survey in the first place. Uh, you're seeing here also a, an image with a with a section of the cathedral from taken from this laser survey, and I wanted to show this image because it brings into um, it juxtaposes our most modern 
iteration of creating 3D models of the cathedral um, with an earlier version of this. So we're seeing a 3D analog model that still exists in the uh, Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine, the museum on the Trocadero in Paris, um, a, a plaster model made shortly before the 19th century restoration of Notre Dame of Paris, and an extremely, it remains today, an extremely valuable resource. Um, so I could, you know, could talk all day with you about the distinctions between these two things and the kinds of information that you're able to get from a 3D laser survey that you're not able to get um, from the analog uh, 3D model. However, both um, do represent, represent the cathedral in their own way and serve as a kind of documentation, not only for scholars, but also for restoration architects. Just briefly, um, this would have been the kind of image that Andrew Tallon was most interested in. Part of the reason that he was most interested in creating the survey for his own research had to do with, as I said, studying the structure of Notre Dame. What he realized was that in creating laser surveys, you were often able to detect um, cases where buildings had always had flying buttresses versus buildings that added flying buttresses, where the architects added flying buttresses later because of structural problems the building was suffering from. And so he was hoping to discover at Notre Dame that the choir in particular had always had flying buttresses and specifically that it probably had single span flying buttresses, not unlike the ones that we now see there uh, today. Those buttresses, of course, were changed and transformed in the 19th century. And so there was long a question about how old they were, the originals were, um, and whether they had been there from the very earliest iteration of the cathedral. In creating this laser scan, he thought that he demonstrated that, um, that you would expect to see sort of deformation in the vaults if uh, the buttresses had been added after the fact in response to structural problems. So this is ultimately the main reason um, that we have the 2010 laser survey that has become so important for Notre Dame. The other goal of this 2010 survey was to create what um, Andrew Tallon liked to consider the first accurate plan of Notre Dame of Paris. Um, and so you're seeing here, for example, a rendering from the laser survey that shows us highlights, especially the high vaults of the cathedral. And then this can be paired with another slice from the scan, which shows uh, the aisle, the vaults over the aisle. Those two renderings um, and other details were combined in order to produce this plan, um, which is the one that is published in Denis Sondron and Andrew Tallon's book, which first appeared in French in 2013 and was republished uh, shortly after the Notre Dame fire, um, and which long had been uh, destined to have an English translation, and that finally um, happened. I, I translated the book myself um, in 2019, and it, and it appeared in 2020. Um, sadly, between these two uh, publications of the original 2013 um, edition and my English translation, Andrew Tallon sadly passed away um, in 2018. But of course, um, this scan has had a life beyond uh, the one that was originally maybe intended for it. Um, of course, the scan was um, shared with the architect of the cathedral at the time when, when Andrew Tallon made it, which was the previous architect en chef, Benjamin Mouton. After that, I'm not exactly sure, I, I can't really recall whether it, it sort of remained um, in the architect's custody uh, from one architect to the other, but um, it, a, a very important step was made where um, Andrew Tallon's widow donated the, um, the scan to the cathedral after the fire to make sure that it was there uh, for their use. One question that, that emerged shortly after the fire, especially once it became clear that the roof would be restored or the whole cathedral would be restored identically, and especially the timber roof would be restored identically, was what role the 3D laser survey might play um, in this reconstruction. So you're seeing on the left a photograph of this structure, um, very brightly lit. If anyone ever actually spent any time in this space or ones like it, you'll know that it's a very dark, uh, very dark space and so needed to be um, artificially lit in order to achieve this photograph. 
and have a very long exposure. And then you see, of course, the, the state after the fire. So a lot to do here, clearly. The 2010 laser survey did um, include the roof. There are um, is data of, about related to the roof that is, is uh, available in the 2010 survey. But as you can see, especially in the rendering on the right, it had a lot of gaps. There were a lot of lacunae in this 2010 laser survey, especially when it came to the roof. As I mentioned, if the goal was to produce an accurate plan and to think about the sort of masonry structure of Notre Dame, the roof really was not the top priority. Um, and I, I highlight this point just to make it clear that this was never intended mostly as a kind of um, as documentation, frankly, in the sense that cultural heritage professionals would think of it, think of it. Um, and so this is why we notice, especially these gaps. Overall, you can uh, get a sense from the this sort of overall view of the laser survey that there are, you know, more than a few gaps. In fact, um, in this survey, especially if you look um, at the north tower, you'll notice additional uh, holes um, in the survey. Luckily, however, um, Andrew Tallon's survey was not the only one that was produced before the fire. And I'm taking you inside right now. I hope you're able to see this, that the video is working and not um, pausing too much. Um, you're able to see this, a kind of walkthrough, a laser survey that was made in, um, I believe, 2014 by the company AGP or Art Graphique et Patrimoine. Um, and you can tell here, I hope, that there's a sort of much finer grain detail, even just in the few years that had elapsed between one scan and the other. Of course, the technology improved. Um, and I, I, I do feel that we, we get a sense for what the roof was really like a little bit more um, in this walkthrough. The French um, National Center for Scientific Research, after the fire, made attempts to pull together together all different kinds of laser and photogrammet uh, photogrammetric and photographic data um, to put it all together into something that is, as I've said before, sort of more than the sum of its parts. This is an amazing resource that was created after the fire, um, but I think it stands as a really good example of the kinds of things that um, heritage professionals in other contexts might take into consideration of creating before disaster strikes um, for monuments um, that are really considered key and central, especially to sort of national cultural heritage. So we're seeing here this composite model um, that is now managed by the CNRS. And um, it's an amazing thing to work through because what it does is overlays the 2010 laser survey with the 2014 laser survey of the roof, with the 2019 laser survey that was made right after the fire. And so you can also juxtapose um, sort of before and after in a very interesting way. Um, in addition to being able to zoom in and um, take measurements and really use it as a scholarly tool, which is the main way that I have been using it recently. The question then becomes, would it be possible or um, would it be possible to sort of restore the roof thanks to this laser survey? And is that indeed what the architects are doing? And I can answer both of those questions. Um, so we're seeing here another detail, another rendering taken from the composite 3D model now. And you start to notice amazing things that you might not have ever seen in a regular ground plan. Um, for example, the way that the at the top of the wall, the way that the uh, wall sort of splays out and widens. This is the kind of thing that I never, as an architectural historian, had considered or thought about. Um, and the implication, implications this, of course, has for the roof, the timber trusses themselves. You're also able to slice uh, through this model to make sense of the distances between the primary roof trusses and going up a level also able to see the uh, distribution of the secondary roof trusses as well. 
You even are able to see bits of the radial frames at the end of the building. So at the end of the apps, I hope you're able to see my uh, cursor here, these radial frames um, at the end of the building. Although I would say that those, there are even holes and gaps in the 2014 laser survey. So this was a case where, again, um, the goal could not have possibly been to make sure every single um, centimeter of the cathedral was captured for the kind of catastrophic event that ultimately did actually unfold. So there are still some gaps in this survey. You're also able to get a sense for the space um, in a very interesting way and can take measurements, of course. If you know what you're looking for, you can take a slice from the model and you're able to measure whatever you need. However, the second question, which is, are the architects using <laughs> the model um, in the restoration of Notre Dame of Paris? I would say when it comes to the recreation of the roof, um, they really are not or are only very sparingly doing so. The reason this is uh, the case is because there was also in this very same period we're thinking about today, so between 2010 and 2015, um, there was also a hand-drawn survey made of the roof. And you're seeing just one page from this beautiful document, um, really an amazing uh, a triumph <laughs> that over a year or so, the two architects you see um, on the screen, Rémi Cromont, who's also working on the restoration campaign, he's one of the restoration architects, and Cédric Trantzou, um, another architect, the two of them went pretty much weekly to the cathedral and documented the building by hand. Because of the nature of roof trusses in particular, by capturing things like heights and widths and depths um, of individual frames, there really is a lot of information that is um, the, the key uh, data points are captured in these beautiful drawings. And so for this reason, I would say this is ultimately the main source for the roof um, in its reconstructed version. However, <laughs> the model has had um, a, a kind of life on the uh, restoration chantier. Notably, I would say the um, unlike the geometry of the roof trusses, where um, you have frames that are usually repeated and um, where it's, it's possible to capture with maybe just three dimensions everything that you need to know about that particular uh, timber. Anything that relates to the flying buttresses, arches, um, ribs of the vaults, these are the things that at Notre Dame, every single one is different. And they're repeated over and over again, but with slightly different geometries. And this is where the architects have really made use of the 3D laser survey is in, for example, um, creating the wooden centering that is then that was then placed shortly after the fire underneath to cradle every flying buttress to prevent collapse or to prevent further collapse if a collapse of the vaults, for example, um, took place. And you can see those wooden centerings here as well, wrapping around the choir. And more recently, um, in 2021, um, when additional centering was created to cradle every single vault inside the cathedral, those two were based on the 3D laser survey. Um, so I would say at Notre Dame, the takeaway, um, there are a couple. Um, one is that it's never too late um, to document a building. I would say um, many people are surprised that it was not until 2010 that this kind of effort was begun. And it really isn't until 2015 that all of the data collected that's necessary for restoring the cathedral identically existed. Um, so it's never too late, late to do so. But also, um, I would say the other takeaway is not to overlook obvious monuments. Um, I know, for example, when Rémi Fromont um, and his colleague Cédric Trantzou went to um, Notre Dame of Paris, they were shocked to learn from the architect at the time that there was not yet a hand-drawn survey of the roof, things like that. Um, I think the same really applies with 3D um, digital documentation as well. 
is that um, you you can't assume that you know no matter how central and important a monument seems that it has been documented. Um, I would also say a little bit of catastrophic thinking is important in the sense that there are some gaps, as we saw in, in the documentation, that if the thought from the get-go had been to document a heritage object so that it could be replicated if necessary, um, that might have led to fuller, more complete results. I think I'll pause there so that I am and, and happy to take any questions so that we have um, enough time for them. <clears throat> that was very, very interesting. Uh, and also the thing, like the documentation that it was made with another purpose, but it actually has helped in the restoration. So <clears throat> I have a colleague here, Karin, that's checking the chat. Do we have any questions there? No. Uh, I have a question because I have listened a little bit through YouTube and other media on other presentations you made mm -hmm. and <clears throat> you uh, have, uh, could you please tell, talk, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the discussions that's been regarding replacing the 19th century spire that was collapsed <clears throat> totally by the fire mm -hmm. uh, and the decisions that were made about the restoration of the spire? Yes. So, I mean, there was a question, I suppose, initially from, from the outside, it appeared that there was a question initially about how to restore the cathedral. I would say the more that I have gotten to, um, to know what really was happening on the site among the stakeholders who have the most say ordinarily in these kinds of matters, um, I really don't think there was ever so much of a question. So this became a kind of political um, you know, by Macron suggesting that there would be an international architectural competition, this really threw a wrench into things. Um, and as I, I've definitely said before, I mean, I think if something like that had happened, it would have been very interesting, but it also would have been really without precedent um, in these kind in in cultural heritage in France. Um, and be, given France's long history of um, even just the profession of you know uh, architects of historic monuments, they have a particular charge, and that is usually to preserve the building as it is. And that also includes, for the most part, especially if you have the resources available to you, um, uh, rebuilding in the case of you know war, conflict, disaster. Um, and so I I would say that. The people who were the least surprised about the outcome are the ones, are architectural historians who have studied these kinds of buildings, and I think anyone in the cultural heritage service themselves um, who saw the, you know, the writing was on the wall all along. I think the question about the 19th century spire, that did present itself. Um, basically, was the 19th century spire um, protected in quite the same way as, let's say, the 13th century roof? Um, and ultimately, it is. I mean, if you look at its listing, it absolutely is. And not only is the building listed, but also um, the, its surroundings and its landscape. And so um, it, it would have been possible for something else to happen if the president had decided to override uh, precedent. But it would have been very surprising um, hmm. if, if, if there had been any other outcome, quite honestly, in this particular context, in this particular place and time. It's, uh, <clears throat> I think the cathedral and other ca cathedrals, are, they are interesting since they are so much uh, built in different periods. It's like it's not a church that is built at a certain time, but it's like also that your documentation is showing that it's added on structures and architecture during time. And the last, I think that, but you can correct me, that the spire was like the last edition. And, and the question is, when is a cultural heritage, when is it completed? Uh, uh, or are we, should we actually continue to add on to the cathedral? Uh, I, I know that that's a discussion that's always made when you do these documentations or when something is lost and you are going to recreate it? Are you going to do it with traditional uh, craftsmanship? Are you going to do it with new material? 
So <clears throat> was, did you have any of that discussion? Do you know anything about that regarding Notre Dame? So the, the material discussion particularly? Yeah. Yes, I mean, um, that's a case too, where I think if the resources hadn't been there or something, maybe a different decision could have been made. But the reality is because of the kind of outpouring of support, especially from the super wealthy in, in France itself, um, it, it wasn't a question. It really wasn't a question. Um, and it had as much of as anything else to do with structure. Um, and so the architect's thought was, we know that this building stood for you know nearly 900 years yeah. with the timber structure on top of it, including the spire. Um, that's what we're going to do again. So I, th I think um, seeing that as a really conservative decision too is, is fair. Um, the fact of hand, there is going to be some hand finishing and dressing, and that's that's a different kind of decision that's being made. Um, and it's amazing, frankly, to see, I, you know, I think that uh, at the very beginning, I wasn't so sure what I thought of that. Um, and the more I've gotten to know some of the carpenters who are um, either involved in this process or um, who want to be involved in this process, I, I have come to appreciate what that brings to the table and how much that sort of re-energizes the building and puts back this kind of embodied work um, into the structure. Um, and so I, I, I'm warming up to the idea as, okay. as time goes on. I actually, we have re actually created a poll uh, in English that we thought that also you can answer and it regards a little bit about this discussion about recreating or adding modern uh, structures so i hope we can get that poll up now it's regarding the spire if you were the one making the de decision on the rebuilding of notre dame and the spire you have one option to choose would you order a complete copy would you create a new modern spire or would you actually order two spires and just interesting to, to see. Do you want to share what you voted, Lindsay? I said I wanted to see both. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, it's interesting, there are little details. You know, I know, for example, the um, rooster that had been placed on the top of the spire, which, you know, was uh, flung far afield from the building and yeah. was recovered. It was in such bad shape that they've decided the architect has designed a new rooster for the top of the spire. So for all this talk of how how exactly the same it's going to be, there will be these little touches if you know where cool. to look. Yeah, so we will have some of our time actually added into Notre Dame. Exactly. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Lindsay, for your presentation and for being with us your early morning. It was a pleasure having you. And uh, thank you very much. With that, you, I know you have more meetings to attend. I'm looking forward to, to see and hear of you again. But for now on, thank you very much. Thank you all. And I would also just say if anyone has any further questions, um, feel, don't hesitate to reach out to me by email. I'm happy to happy to get in touch after the fact. Thanks, yes. Nina.